and uh, okay uh for myself i think i, I did a, a I did a PhD at UCL and at the end of the PhD, I was actually not yet so decided whether I would stay in an academia. That was my first idea while I was studying or whether to go to industry. So I actually applied for, for all. <laughs> and, and actually I tested uh, in interviews and, uh, and understanding uh, what it would look like uh, to see what, uh, what uh, felt uh, the best uh, solution for me at that point. Um, so for me, and maybe that, that, that's my suggestion, uh, uh, although all of you seem set on industry, even to choose between industries, uh, I think the interviewing a process and get to know these people and their locations is very useful. Um, so indeed, I felt that a bit, uh, like David said, I felt ready for facing a bit the, 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 uh, the world outside, uh, outside academia in terms also of lifestyle or where I would have lived and the, the experience that would come and the amount of people I would work with. Um, and, and just among the, the, the industries that, uh, that offered me a job, uh, I felt quite at peace and intrigued uh, by, by Shell back then. Thanks a lot. Um, we did have a few questions come through before about internships. Um, whether any of you um, did an internship or when, if any of your companies offer them. Um, has anyone got any comments on, on that? I do. Uh, Jessica, yeah, thanks. So before I went to uni, I actually did a year in industry and I worked at, uh, for BP. They used to own a place in Dorset called Witch Farm and that was quite a lot of really good process engineering experience because the actual site where they had the offices was right next to the process plant. So I learned all this valuable stuff that I actually work with a lot now. And I actually work, my job now is to kind of design the safety processes around those systems. Uh, so that was, I did that. And that's when I decided that I would definitely be a chemical engineer. So even though I obviously applied to uni before that was kind of the, what helped me decide to stick it out. Um, and then I didn't do any more internships while I was at uni, but I did go back there for the summer after my second year because they just offered me a job, um, me and someone else who'd been there doing an apprenticeship beforehand, which was again, quite useful experience and also quite a nice job to have really over the summer. It beat working at Morrison's, I must admit, which I'd done the year before. Um, and then my company do actually offer placements. Uh, actually, we do currently have someone from UCL has just started their year in industry at uh, Genesis for this year. So it, they are worth uh, looking out for. I'm not really sure about when they advertise them. I'm guessing usually around early like spring or summer uh, before you finish uni or are done, you know, finish your academic year. We do, like, we do offer placements. Thanks, Jessica. Um, anyone else got any uh, thoughts on that? Dina? Yeah, um, I think my experience is not very relevant because I did my undergrad back in Lebanon. So maybe I'll focus on the internships that the previous company I was working at and now what they offered. So um, if you're interested in software development, um, DAI, Digital Applications um, International, um, they offer year in industry for students as well as summer internships um, for students that are finishing their degrees or doing their masters. Um, and McKinsey does offer summer internships um, for business analysts or junior associates or associates, depending on if you want to like apply during your undergrad after it or after a post um, degree, postgraduate degree. Great, thank you very much. Um, more of a general question, um, sort of uh, what advice would you give to current students um, when they're planning their career path and their next steps? So anything um, to help them sort of get started? Um, maybe go to Fabian? Yeah, sure. Um, one advice that I would get give is probably to um, try to reflect more about what you see yourself doing like 
down the line um, and what you want to do and also to think of um, your different like skills and interests like we usually think of them or list them on the CV as sort of the same thing but uh, your skills and your interests might not necessarily be the same thing you might be really good at something but you don't really uh, it might not be what you want to do for sort of the rest of your life or for uh, a number of years and so it could be helpful to kind of list what are the skills and what are you actually interested in and from there try to kind of see what um, industries or sectors might be suitable for you or that you might want to work with which can kind of combine those skills and interests in maybe unique ways um, and I would also encourage to do um, internships to, to get a feeling of like okay do I like this type of job um, or even if, even doing like some maybe like research internships um, at UCL so you can see do I like doing research do I like this academic path or um, what I want to do so it, to just to give yourself some experience. That's great. Um, maybe I'll Jamish. I can yep. see you've unmuted. Yeah, no, just to echo what uh, Fabian said as well. Um, I think it's always good to have a, a reason uh, or begin with a why, um, as Simon Sinek always alludes to um, uh, in his uh, in his Start With Why, um, his book, um, which I highly recommend reading. It's um, not only just for business leaders or uh, any leader in general, it's also for anyone starting out in their career. Um, always have something to to look at and and wow you startle you um, something that draws or you gravitate towards um, and then from then on um, with the golden circle so it begins with the why and then the how so how um, are you going to get to your ultimate why um, what are the steps what are the um, what are your goals, so your weekly, uh, your monthly or your yearly goals to get to your ultimate why. Um, and also, yeah, as Fabian alluded to, it's more about experimentation. Uh, we're all engineers here. We've all been involved in lab work and uh, research. So um, it's a matter of finding what you gravitate towards, what you, what you lean into, um, and it's going to take time. Um, you're not going to accomplish uh, your career goals in a matter of a week or a month or even a year so um stick at whatever it is that you're you're willing to put your mind to um and then yeah if you're not if you're not into it then there's always another career path or another uh, another choice that you can make uh, further down the line but um yeah don't um always temper your expectations as well um sometimes you may have um one thing in mind that you want to that you want to accomplish um but sometimes doesn't work out in the end so um yeah always um have that ultimate why um your reason to to start the career that you're intending to start um and also yeah just uh, get involved in, in as many things as um as you possibly can really um yeah that's my can i, can I add, add on to, can i add on to that i think yes, i please. think fabian and jamish i don't have anything else to add to what you said just that Ment mentorship getting mentors also helps so you know you need to know the why like jamie said everything fabian said is also accurate you need to understand what you're you know what you gravitate towards what you're really going to enjoy because in the end the money will come right don't chase the money chase your passion but i think experience is you can't you can't buy it right so i think having mentors that you trust or that you role models that have been there perhaps like us, if you see us as role models, a bit awkward for me to kind of see myself as a role model, but, you know, we can advise to say, look, that makes sense. But in, in true honesty, it's nowadays, people don't stay in one job, right? So you're going to, you're going to move, you're going to have more career changes than even we have, in my opinion. So like Jay mentioned and Fabian said, experiment, see what works for you, understand your why, but seek advice from your network, get mentors. And, and the final thing I will say is, when you go for those interviews don't be nervous right as much as the companies uh, have got the roles open and it's a it's a competition right a war for talent a war on talent they need to be selling themselves to you guys so i wouldn't get nervous i would you know i would go in there and ask them what their goals are what their why is right so that they know that they're getting real talent and and i think that's the way it's got to be otherwise you're gonna 
hopefully not but ho otherwise if you don't do the things the guys have said and, and you know get experiences and you you are the asset you might you might regret it so don't have any regrets guys that's my uh that's my my two cents Thank you. Uh, yeah, I really like that advice. And I'll pick up on a couple of things. So you mentioned mentoring. So we are hoping that following this session um, will help um, the students connect with, with people through, through the Bentham Connect and hopefully start to develop those conversations. Um, and also, um, yeah, about career changes. I wondered whether any of you have had what you would consider a significant career change to date and, and sort of what led to that. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have, particularly. Uh, Jessica? Well, I kind of have, uh, but not for a really long time. So my first job after university was that of a simulation engineer, which I absolutely hated. It was so boring. Um, it was quite like smart, actually, because they built all the mathematical, mathematical models and then I had to link them and uh, mimic um, process controls, so we would replicate what um, real life operators would have in their control room, and we would do that for operator training. So that was uh, really interesting and really valuable, but I just did not enjoy it. Like the actual work was kind of dull for me personally. Um, so then after that, I decided to follow my passion, which was that I wanted to work in events. So I quit my job and worked for Oxfam for a year and was a fundraiser, and I managed five teams around uh, the Midlands and Wales and went to loads of music events, which was what I wanted to do. But unfortunately, to get a job in that again, when I wanted another paid job, not, not, that, not a year of working for free, um, you find that they don't really pay that well, especially not in 2011, when there was a massive uh, market crash and the house bubble crash and everything went pear-shaped. So that's where I went to Plan B, which was being a safety engineer. And obviously, safety engineer has been fairly lucrative because since then I've moved to a more technical safety engineering role when I moved to Genesis, and I've quite enjoyed it. Um, but I am also thinking of potentially career changing, where you know I work in primarily oil and gas, and I want to shift out of that. And I also think that I might want to do something a bit different to safety engineering while still using the same skills. However. Watch this space. That sounds exciting. I mean, are you excited by the prospect of potentially having another career change, or is it nerve wracking? Or I mean, ask me when I maybe applied for some jobs because I haven't so far. So, but I, I say it's true to follow your passions, but I, I think also have a plan B is also a good idea. And sometimes you do just land in a role that ends up being quite fruitful and you do get to um, um, enjoy it and learn a lot. So safety engineering was never, ever, ever one of my plans ever. And I've actually learned a lot and grown a lot in the role. And I have enjoyed it for quite a long time. So, you know, I think it's fine to take life and jobs as they come and accept them at face value and do them for a bit and then decide how you might want to change within a company or in terms of careers as well. And especially as things are changing so much now, um, like renewables are way more ahead of the game than they were um, 12 years ago, 13 years ago when I finished uni. And even the chemical engineering degree has changed considerably since, uh, well, David and I were at uni where it relied more on like, um, chemical processes for oil and gas primarily, and now it's completely shifted and it's quite a different degree. So, yeah, it's my two cents. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that. Um, we've had a couple of students drop off. I'm hoping they might rejoin. Um, I've got one more question for this session, unless any of the students want to um, ask anything. Yeah, um, I've got a question. Uh, yes, Prince, yeah. thank you. Uh, so my question is, uh, what are the, uh, some of the key lessons that you learned early on uh, as a young professional? I, I would say stay, stay hungry to learn, right? Um, you know, you're, you're in the career, you, you just got to soak everything up. So the key lesson for me is don't, don't, don't just see it as a nine to five. Everything we've just said 
people, obviously, that you know that we, we haven't seen is that I know what your why is, but always ask questions, seek to learn, and just be dedicated in, in the craft, right? Because the more you do that, the more you actually understand what it is, where your career wants to go. Um, that For me, that's the most important thing, asking questions, seeking, and just being curious. I think, I think have have that curiosity and, and just have the desire to just just want to just soak it all in never say no to any any experiences especially early on don't try and compartmentalize yourself like Jessica said you know even if even if you're doing really good in a safety role or in a role that you join if there's an opportunity to change within you know horizontally within an organization I say go for it because it's the quickest way to climb the ladder or get to where Jamish is start your own company do something you really love so I would say the most the, the most important thing I've learned is just learn and be hungry for you know for learning and just embrace change um, in your career. So my two cents again. Thank you. Thanks, David. Yeah, I really like that question as well. Um, this might be maybe for Dina or um, someone who um, one of you who did a PhD, but. Um, Quite interested to know um, the re your reasons for going into industry um, as opposed to academia. Dina, I know that you were a teaching fellow um, for a time, so sort of your experiences working in both academia and industry um, and how they compare. Yeah, um, I'm not quite sure what was going through my head when I started to look into industry. But I think I just wanted to experience something else and see the difference um, between both. Um, to be honest, like, I would love to go back to research at some point. Um, it has a lot of perks um, and it is absolutely fascinating because you don't have the um, leisure, I guess, to be so independent in other jobs and do your own thing. And at the same time, have the guidance from, you know, like um, your PhD supervisor or whether you're doing a postdoc. Um, I think with the teaching fellowship, I definitely also had um, a big level of independence and I was like, you know, really working on my own work streams, obviously with the guidance that was needed. This is not usually the case in industry, um, especially like, for example, in consulting where I'm at at the moment, um, it's mostly based on teamwork, which was exactly the opposite of a PhD. Um, and I think I'm enjoying, like I've enjoyed the PhD, but I'm also really enjoying the other side um, of the working environment. This would be probably the main difference. Um, I guess the other difference would be also um, in research, you're really working on a micro scale um, and you're getting, um, I guess, the skill set in something so small in a specific device, in a specific field um, in engineering. Um, versus um, another kind of like, you know, job in industry. Again, my reference is probably mostly consulting where you're getting exposed to a lot of different industries, a lot of different practices and functions um, and working more like, you know, on the bigger picture. So I think these are the main differences. But for me, I don't really have a preference for one or the other. Um, I really enjoyed the research, but I'm also really enjoying like the new world, I guess, of industry at the moment. So I'll let you know in a couple of years time um, where my head's at. Thanks, Dina. Um, right, I think I'm going to pass back over to Claire, um, who might talk about a couple more polls, um, and then the next session, the next theme. Thank you, Lizzie. Uh, thank you, everyone. You're all incredibly inspiring. I'd like to come and work for all of you, uh, so please give me a job. That would be great. Um, so we're going to go on to another session, which is based more on the skills that you actually need within your industries um, and how you develop them through your um, MSCs or your PhDs or your studies in general. Um, just to start with, we're going to do another couple of polls. So, Mark, if you could queue up poll number two. Um, so this is for the students to answer. So which, which three soft skills do you think are most important in the workplace? Prince and Alia, if you want to enter your answers on the poll, if you can see it. Teamwork, yeah. And resilience down the bottom. I think resilience is such a great thing to, to learn and become better at. Communication, yeah.
Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, Mark, if you could just end that poll and queue up the next one for me. So this one is based on your current career plan and whether you have one or whether you do not have one. You wanted to answer that, the students? Okay, that's good. Hopefully um, you've gained some ideas from our fantastic alumni from today. Um, but what we'll do is next is move on to the next session, uh, as I said, to kind of speak more about the skills required going into uh, various different sectors. So Mark, if you could end that poll, that would be brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so do either of the students have any questions? Otherwise I'm happy to crack on with a couple. Nope. Okay, I'll get started. So um, obviously for any of the alumni that are here, what challenges did you face when job hunting? Do you have any tips? Anyone want to take that one? Was it easy? Was it hard? Mm -hmm. and then maybe just let, let me let me share a bit from my from my side. Uh, I uh, I started the uh, job hunting towards the end of my PhD, and that was in 2008 and nine. Challenge was the, the world crisis. <laughs> so, and I was in the, in the UK, so many companies just that stopped hiring graduates that year. So there was lots around me of the, 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 the discouraging experiences. My two cents is, um, Every, each of us is his own experience when job hunting. I think I ended up with some 12 offers. <laughs> and, and, and I did also for me, I said, nah, 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 that, that, it won't happen, they won't reply, there's nothing. I had several offers from, from uh, uni and as well as, uh, as uh, industries in Europe, in the US. Uh, uh, so don't let let's say the situation uh, discourage you, just, just go for it and try yourself. Uh, and, uh, and don't be shy to, 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 to put yourself out there. And, uh, and honestly, it was also quite nice for me. Sometimes they, uh, they were asked, okay, we will let you know. And I said, well, could you please let me know within two days? Otherwise I'm gone because <laughs> I have something else waiting. And, and I think uh, it gave me also a bit that uh, self-confidence uh, to also perform at those interviews and stuff. So don't be shy to put yourself there and don't take other people's experiences, of course, for learning and inspiration, but each and one of us has his own path. Thank you very much. Do you feel like you, did you have any help in terms of writing an application or a CV when you were first starting out job hunting? Or did you kind of learn that as you started applying for things? Uh, uh, all of it. Of course, I reached out to, to, to for example, friends that have finished the PhD before me uh, to ask what was their experience, what were they asked at interviews, uh, um, uh, what did they think helped and not in the specifics. So don't be shy to, to pick up the phone, of course, from us, but also from people that maybe did it a bit uh, more recent than, for example, <laughs> but uh, really don't uh, don't uh, don't be shy. Oh, absolutely, I asked my friends, "Can you please read uh, my CDs, my PhD advisors?" Uh, so why not? I mean, many people will have to read your CV, but their friends and and the people next to you that can also help you to see yourself better and describe yourself better. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good tip. And also through Bentham Connect, there's obviously people that are at different parts of their career. So people who have just applied and got new jobs, um, people that are 10 years, 20 years into their career. So hopefully the students connect with people that are at different different levels, which is fantastic. Um, Can I just, just add one more thing as well here? Yeah, go for it. Um, I think maybe because it's um, it was like a very difficult journey. Um, I think my main advice would be 
don't be disheartened and don't take it personally. Many times, like I can't tell you the number of times I applied for jobs and I got rejections. And every time I thought there was something wrong with me or with my CV or with my skill set, etc. And I think everyone obviously goes through this journey more or less. But honestly, it has nothing to do with you. Um, lots of places are just not hiring. They don't say it. Or like, you know, they're looking for one candidate out of a thousand, quite literally. Um, and believe me, the amount of time that they spend on CVs is not a lot, especially when they're getting a lot of CVs, you know, for one specific position. So don't be disheartened. Um, and the second thing is don't decide um, for yourself if you're good enough for the job or not. Many of us look at a job ad and think that we're not good enough for that job. Let them decide for you if you're good enough or not, because then you're just eliminating options that actually might be great options for you. And the self-doubt that obviously everyone has again, and I know it's very easy to say these things, but you have literally nothing to lose. Sending more and more applications out there is not going to take a lot more time. Obviously, it's going to take time and the journey is long, but you will get there eventually. But don't decide for the recruiter if you're good enough or not. That's a really good tip. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have anything to add to that particular comment? Um, I'm just going to direct a question at Fabian, who's obviously you're in the middle of a PhD at the moment, I think. Um, and whether you feel like there's any skills that you're developing through your PhD that are going to help you when applying for jobs in the future. Yeah, um, uh, I think a big kind of skill that you get when you're when you're doing a PhD is just like resilience, sticking through with like projects when they, experiments are not working and everything. Um, but apart from that, um, uh, a lot of uh, skills I also get from just like outside of the PhD in general, um, more sort of like team working skills, like I'm doing a lot of like outreach. Um, so I get like uh, science communication kind of skills. It's very important to kind of communicate your science to different levels of audience to like kids, adults, um, sci other scientists. Um, so those are like some of the skills uh, that I'm developing throughout um, and some of the projects as well. I've been collaborating with other, um, other research groups. And so you get a lot of like teamwork experience and kind of communicating between different uh, people who are doing more theory and people who are doing more um, uh, experiments. Um, but again, it's also, uh, especially since um, after my PhD, I'm planning to apply to industry. And I have also noticed that a lot of the other skills that I gained doing, especially my undergrad in like engineering are very relevant. Like you're doing all these like scenario projects that help that uh, you might think will not be super, very relevant maybe in the future, but it actually kind of uh, is a good um, talking point and like skills that you do um, develop when you work on like different projects with other people from your cohort and other uh, engineering degrees. Um, and so there's a lot of skills that you kind of develop that's uh, also not entirely in your job or in your role um, that you can also find from like outside uh, things. So if you're uh, in part of some kind of um, club or organization, you can get some like leadership experience. There's a lot of these like soft skills that really helps you stand out when you're applying. Thank you. And I presume you're also able to connect with people from industry during your PhD as well. Sorry? Oh, am I on mute? No. So I presume no. you're also able to connect with people in industry um, during your PhD. So with companies and suppliers and. Yeah, no, exactly. And one thing that's getting really more and more relevant that um, you should also take advantage of is like create like a LinkedIn profile. And um, one thing that really helps you uh, and in really increases your chances of actually getting sort of acceptance when you're applying is to, if you have a specific job um, or role in mind, you can sort of look up people on LinkedIn that works in that role. And then you can, usually people that are working are more than happy to 
connect with students and have some kind of video call and ask questions on like answer any questions you might have. And then that is also a good chance because that uh, sometimes for what happens a lot in companies is that people who do work in companies get um, also like commission from um, referring good candidates to kind of um, HR or whatever that looks through your resumes. And so if you do connect with a lot of people there that can help you kind of uh, prioritize your applications so they really do get sort of seen because a lot of times like they will spend probably like 30 seconds to a minute on your CV in HR. Um, but if you do have that connection in the company, um, even if it's just like you've only been on met that person maybe like once or twice uh, through like a call or something, but that really um, helps you with your application to get visibility. Yeah, I think connections are really, really helpful. Um, as we've got lots of industry people here, do you have any sort of insider knowledge as to how our students could prepare for interviews um, within industry? Maybe Jessica or? Um, well, firstly, what I would say is don't lie on your CV because when you have an interview, they are most likely going to go through your CV and ask you questions on each of the sections, so each area of experience. Uh, so that's my first bit of advice. Embellish it, yes, but don't lie. Um, the second bit of advice is to practice. So I think sometimes it's useful. You can find questions online um, and just practice with a friend or maybe if you have a mentor or someone like that, that will help you. Uh, because I think uh, nerves can be a really big part when you're um, obviously in an interview. And obviously, the more you practice and the more comfortable you are with the kind of standard answers, then the better. Um, I'd also, so that, those are my real two tips, to be honest, um, that I've experienced from being in an interview where we've, I've assisted in interviewing um, another candidate. It's just mainly going through your CV. And it doesn't hurt to also have hobbies and interests outside of um, what your job is, because um, recruiters or let's say employers, they're not just looking for someone who is just brilliant and amazing. They're looking for someone who is a good fit to the company um, or and in terms of personality as well. And I think that's very important, especially if you're going into a job which requires a lot of teamwork because a team is not made of just leaders. It's made of people who are able to take a step back as well. So and I think that's very important as well, just to highlight the kind of all-rounded person that you are when you're in an interview. Yeah. Thank you. May, um, may I add to, or we move forward? Sorry, Giovanna. No, may, may I add something or? Yes, of course, yeah, please do, yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, indeed uh, um, your your CV needs to be true. It needs to to, to also uh, represent uh, your technical skills. Um, the, the, those could be tested with a few questions or with presentations. They'll see. But I think the differentiator are often indeed looking at the person you are and the role you will be able to play in the in the industry. Um, communication skills are vital especially if you think of working in a, in a complex company, you will not only talk to engineers who know your lingo, what you're talking about. You need to explain uh, concepts to people which are not as technical as you. And usually those sort of things are tested during uh, interviews. Um, your teamwork, absolutely. Uh, be conscious of your behavior, especially if the interviews involve so, so, uh, uh, let's say role playing. Uh, be, be 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 conscious of uh, of how you are uh, behaving towards uh, the, the the people you are working with. Not be only focus on shining yourself. Uh, I, I saw many people falling on uh, on concentrating. I need to show I'm the best uh, of the of the of the team. Um, you need to make the team uh, the best you can with uh, with. So be mindful also what happens and the mechanisms during the interviews, yeah. Thank you very much. 
Um, Jamish, just to ask you a question. Is he still here, actually? Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah, um, um, <laughs> so you did an MSE in ChemEng, um, and you now have your own business. I was just wondering whether there's particular skills that you learned in your MSc that helped you feel confident enough to start up your own business. Um, yeah, I uh, had a read through the, the agenda earlier. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say, yeah, my lecturers will probably, uh, if they're watching, they probably won't be best pleased. But uh, in terms of the, the content of the, the MSc, I wouldn't say it's been integral. Um, I would say some parts have been. Um, such as the the entrepreneurship classes um, in the evenings where they brought in um, either old UCL alumni who started their own businesses or um, entrepreneurs who um, were quite pertinent to um, to the actual content of that course, um, which was quite inspiring for me. Um, and yeah, that then um, just yeah spark something um in terms of just wanted to start something myself i have always had the intention of um of starting my own business uh, particularly in the renewable sector um and yeah i think i just needed that impetus to to help me begin really um and yeah i think ucl just gave me that platform um i would say it was it wasn't just it's not the content at all it's the people behind the content um so whoever you bump into um make the most out of every conversation every interaction um and yeah i was blessed with um being there being on the msc course where it's an international eclectic group of people um and it just helps you um helps you become more not more embrace diversity and and just uh um yeah allows you to to stand out as well in terms of um you can bring something that um they don't necessarily have um, in terms of personality traits or skill sets and vice versa. You can learn a lot, learn a lot from um, other people's experiences as well. So yeah, it was more so definitely personality traits um, in terms of learning from others. Um, and then just the ability to communicate as well. Um, I definitely, yeah, um, learned a lot from, learned a lot from the MC course in terms of how to um how to communicate and um solve problems as well um not only just uh, the chemical engineering problems but menial problems as well um as it's going to happen in the workplace um quite quite often um so yeah i think those three things really and embracing rejection as as dina mentioned earlier um that's just going to become part and parcel of this process of um applying to jobs or even throughout your career um it's having that resilience as as the guys and uh, who who voted in the polls said um, that's very much an integral skill to have um, persistence and resilience so yeah those two things coupled with the ability com to communicate and um, and solve problems and you're almost yeah you're pretty much there so yeah those were the things that um that yeah I'd, I'd say definitely to will help you kickstart any uh, your career or a business so thank you and do you actually hire people now um in your business so we've we're currently hiring out the management team um so the the higher echelons of the company at the moment um but yeah we will be um we're looking to close the our fundraising come the end of the year um and then start hiring beginning of next year or early q1 next year so um, yeah, we'll be on the lookout for, for new graduates, that's for sure. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone else have anything that they'd like to add in terms of uh, skills they've developed? Um, maybe people that have been in businesses for a long time, how they've developed presentation skills, public speaking, that sort of thing? That, that for me was maybe one of the nicest skills I developed to do it in my PhD and, and was one, uh, let's say, of the advantages I also found starting as a, as a well, graduate uh, in, in Shell. Uh, definitely during the PhD, I participated and presented in several conferences uh, 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 around the world. And that's a very nice way to start putting yourself uh, on a podium <laughs> and and, uh, and share um, and and uh, in, in several occasions during my my careers I had the same opportunity in, in Shell 
uh, both for other companies at conferences as well, or for business partners. Um, I, I, did I, did, uh, I think it's something I always liked. I know, I know it gives me, it gives me energy. Uh, and, uh, and to build the skill is always, in, I found two things, uh, a few things, definitely ask and accept feedback check <laughs> uh, so so learn from your own performances and uh, look out for people that you admire and think okay how well how did they make it work so well and how how can i learn and uh, and potentially replicate uh but know for yourself i think if you if you enjoy it and and again uh, that lead will think oh can i do it um you will build all the, also that trust i think by doing that yeah, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone is important, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I was going to ask David a question. I think he may have disappeared. Yeah, David, I think he greeted us on the chat then. David and Dina had to head off at 1.30, oh, so sorry, they, they've gone. Okay, fine. Um, the students, I don't know if you've got any questions in relation to skills that you'd like to ask. Um, otherwise, that's the end of that session. Oh, no? uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to quickly say on the point of public speaking that there are lots of clubs out there that one can join uh, and they're not always necessarily that expensive where you can actually practice public speaking and get feedback in like a club, in a, you know, in a friendly group or a friend, friendly setting and if you are interested in that um, it's called cool. well there's one that I know of that I'm a part of called Toastmasters they have loads of clubs in London and around the world and even though I'm not a fan of the bureaucratics of the organization but it is a really good place to practice public speaking if you really want to work on that and it's a nice friendly environment to do it in and it's usually quite uh, cost-wise it's usually quite um accessible to everyone so i recommend that as well as a you know um, a way to pr practice public speaking um if you don't do enough of that already or you know not everyone will be doing a lot of presentations but it is always a really good good skill to have um, in regardless of your work environment and setting that's a really good tip thank you um we've just had a question in the chat from sarah um, saying, do you recommend doing a year in industry? Have any of the alumni here actually done that during their studies? I did it before my studies, and I said I think it was really valuable. Um, I think, um, for instance, lots of the guys that we have graduates that we have in our company, in Genesis, in our company, a lot of them are. Um, uh, um, I was going to say kids, a lot of them are young people who actually came and did a year in industry before they completed their degree, then went back and did the final year and then got hired basically as graduate. So it kind of like made the process for them really easy because they basically got a job straight out of uni um, without having to really apply very hard for it because they already had worked there and they, you know, everyone knew them and networking it within you are in a year in industry it's a really great opportunity to not also just get a feel for what the job is and if you are actually interested in it because you might just think that it's not for you which is fine but it's also a really good way of meeting people and networking and like hopefully you know if that's of interest to you like getting a foot in the door or when you've finished university and yeah, let yeah, me equal that Sorry, Jessica, I keep interrupting you. Uh, Giovanna, sorry, you go for it. No, I'm talking too much, but myself as well, when I was still in Italy during my master's, uh, I took uh, uh, actually just a three months uh, internship with Procter & Gamble. Uh, part indeed well, been a great summer job, <laughs> rather. Um, and, and, and indeed, then I went back to studying and moved to, to, to a PhD as well, first of all, it, I had a relationship then with Proctor and they kept offering me a couple of positions uh, that I never took, but, uh, but definitely the, 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 the connection was there. But it was also quite a nice uh, talking point going out of university even after a PhD that I already had some industry uh, uh, experience and exposure in my CV. So if you have a, a, an opportunity 
as a research project, summer jobs, uh, uh, to, to already put yourself out there. I found it as a very strong uh, uh, talking point uh, when applying uh, after the PhD. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Any questions about anything for our alumni? No, nope. and anything else that the alumni would like to add? Otherwise, I'll pass over to Lizzie, who's going to talk about the next steps. Lizzie, it's over to you, I think. Yeah, OK. Well, yeah, thank you very much. We'll do sort of, we might sort of wrap up a little bit earlier, um, just because we didn't split out. Um, I just want to share my screen um, for the students that are here. Um, Lizzie, we've got another question, actually. Oh, OK, great. Go for it. Um, so the question is, was it hard to transition back to study after the year in industry? Jessica, that might be for you potentially. Uh, well, I, I did my year in industry before I started my undergrad, but it was quite hard to study again after, you know, a year of working, earning money. I really loved it. It was great fun. Um, but then after, after a little while, you get into back into uni life and it's brilliant again, you're with your friends, uh, not so much exams, I hate exams, so, but, uh, so I, think, I think it's not that hard really, you get back into it. I think the hard thing is, you know, parting with the hard end cash you earned over that year or the three month summer, because normally you get paid quite decently um, during those industry years, so. Yeah, then you're going back to being a student and paying all that money into student loan. Otherwise, I don't think it's that hard really to go back into studying again. Thank you. Sorry, did you have another question or is that everything? No more questions as yet. So maybe you get back to you, Lizzie. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Thanks, Sarah. Um, if you think of anything, just type it in whilst I'm just talking about um, next steps. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, Claire, if you could just let me know it's working this time and if you can um, see me scrolling through the Sway document. Um, yes, it's working now, yep. Yeah, okay. So I just want to sort of sway through this for the students. Um, you should have a link to this document and it should give you a little bit of information about um, things you can do next. So obviously there's the information here about Bentham Connect and how you can access the platform. A um, little bit of sort of tips of how to use it and how to get the, the most out of it. We've obviously got our alumni profiles here um, and their Bentham Connect uh, user IDs so you can send them a message after this event if you think of anything. Um, we would like um, you to um, follow up after this event with a few with a few things so to make the most of this event and, and sort of make sure that you're um, built, starting to build your network. Um, we'd like you to connect with someone um, on the Bentham Connect platform, it could be someone from this event or someone else that you find on the on site. Um, and also highlight a skill area that you think you would like to improve uh, following this session. Um, I'm going to send you a document after this. It won't take you very long to uh, fill out, um, but it's just sort of a five step plan of things you could do um, before you complete your studies. Um, and we're hoping to catch up with you um, in the new year, um, see how you're getting on and give you any further support, um, either with uh, making connections or developing your sort of career plan and goals um, going forward. Um, so do take a look at the Sway document. At the bottom, there is some resources here. Um, so things um, from UCL careers that might help you, um, particular events, um, and um, other links to do with like mentoring schemes and internships. Um, so feel free to have a look at that. And but I will follow up with you all um, via email um, uh, tomorrow. Um, so um, if there's no other questions or anything, any other input from the alumni, I'll just hand back to Claire then. Thank you. 
Um, so all I really wanted to say was thank you to the alumni for your time today. Honestly, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, we had slightly less students than we were expecting. Uh, however, we did have quite a few sign up to the program. Um, so we'll share the video with them so that they do still get the benefits um, of everything that you guys shared with us today. So thank you so, so much. Thank you to Lizzie and Katie and Mark that have all been helping behind the scenes to get the event set up. Um, and to the students who have uh, spent their time here today and hopefully you're able to take lots of exciting uh, tips and skills um, away from this. So thank you very much for coming. Um, and that's it. So thank you everybody and hopefully see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for so having me. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye. Thanks everyone. Take care and keep in touch. Bye. Yeah. Bye.